Thank you, Candice. Thank you, Candice. And uh, hello and welcome everyone uh, to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Martin and uh, today I will be talking about cloud native application security and uh, its relation to open source alongside with Tim Miller, um, a technical marketing engineer at uh, Outshift by Cisco. Um, First, let us introduce ourselves uh, in just a few sentences. Uh, my name is Martin, and uh, lately I'm a product manager at uh, Outshift by Cisco, uh, where we are focusing on cloud native application security. I have a strong engineering background, and uh, I was lucky enough to work on a lot of uh, different open source projects uh, in my past, especially with uh, my previous company before we joined Cisco. Uh, we've launched uh, some successful open source projects uh, that were also continued uh, within Outshift. And uh, two of those, uh, the logging operator and uh, bank walls are now on track to become C and CF sandbox projects. Um, I think logging operator already got accepted and uh, hopefully it will happen with bank walls soon as well. Um, nowadays, I'm mostly working on open clarity uh, alongside a few other things. Uh, but that's enough about myself. Tim, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure thing. Thanks, Martin. Um, uh, my name is Tim Miller. Uh, I've been a longtime Linux user. Uh, you'll see in the little bio there, I, I jokingly say I've been there and done that and got many t-shirts. Um, so long time uh, Linux user uh, from uh, you know the days of Red Hat Enterprise Linux sorry, Red Hat Linux before the enterprise days um, and was a system administrator for quite a number of years, evolved into the, the rest of all those things that we build into data centers, right? So I've, I've run networks, I run high performance computing environments, um, automated all that. I'm a big uh, programmability and automation fan. So, uh, and run the gamut in that space. For those uh, dinosaurs like me out there, CF Engine might ring a bell, um, Puppet, Ansible, of course, nowadays, and Terraform. Um, so a long time open source user. Um, I've not been much of a contributor, but as my background shows, a huge fan of, of the space, a huge supporter of the, of the space and a believer. So happy to you know, be part of this conversation and, and to show you what we're, what we're lining up here with the Open Clarity Project. Cool, thank you, Tim. Um, okay, uh, so let me start with uh, talking a bit about uh, the current state of application security uh, in general uh, within the cloud native space. Because, um, yeah, we are talking a lot about how cloud native changed the landscape, how we were introduced to microservices, containers, Kubernetes, and how it improves um, scalability, resilience, and how it gives us easier upgrades and a lot of other great things that um, that we are really talking about a lot. But um, from a security standpoint, from an application security standpoint, it uh, also introduces a lot of challenges as well. First, because, um, well, of course, we, we are running a lot more services than before. And uh, that means that uh, we have a broader attack surface uh, they are running a lot of cloud resources um, from serverless applications to containers to different kind of uh, Kubernetes installments. Um, it complicates things a bit and uh, it means that uh, some new attack passes are appearing that were not there before. Um, these environments are also dynamic by their nature. Um, and that means that um, it's really hard to maintain a constant security posture because you have resources that come and go. Uh, maybe you run a security scan uh, a few minutes uh, before and uh, now there are some new resources coming up. How do you know that uh, those are secure or not? Um, so things are changing uh, a lot more frequently than before. And um, that is uh, harder from the security standpoint. But also we have a lot of, lot of uh, secrets or credentials flowing around uh, in our cloud native environments. Um, 
these are distributed across our uh, VMs, across our Kubernetes uh, deployments. Uh, somehow we need to uh, maintain those. Um, that's also a bit harder than before. Um, and along with uh, the technical changes uh, of Kubernetes, uh, there came the whole uh, DevOps approach of things, like how um, the frequency of deployments uh, are now much faster. Uh, we are doing much faster release cycles. It means that we are introducing new features and effectively new code uh, into our production environments more frequently as before. Um, that means that we need to uh, shift our uh, security uh, standpoint uh, left, shifting left uh, to earlier in the release cycle. So we need to introduce new security features within our CI CD deployments, within how we uh, build applications within how uh, we are building containers, uh, how we are distributing those, those containers, and actually about how we write code. So security starts with writing code, actually. If uh, you're writing down a few lines of code, uh, the best way to uh, prevent uh, some kind of security uh, risk happening is to just let the developer know that uh, you are writing something down that you shouldn't. So things are changing uh, from the security uh, standpoint in cloud native. And um, well, organizations recognize uh, the importance of this. And uh, they are constantly looking for uh, solutions that can help them, that can uh, help them overcome these, uh, these new challenges. But, but it's not easy because uh, on one hand, uh, traditional tools are often fall short just because they focus on uh, parameter level security. Um, they are focusing on how things were with monoliths and, uh, and traditional environments. But of course, there are a lot of new tools um, appearing in the cloud native space. Um, but as uh, with all other things in cloud native, it is a really fragmented space. There are a lot of uh, different solutions out there. If you look at the CNCF landscape and just look at the security section, you will see a lot, lots and lots of companies and uh, projects that are trying to break into this market. And uh, on one hand, it's good because uh, you have a lot to choose from. But on the other hand, it's uh, it makes things difficult because you can end up in this security limbo because you don't know what to focus on, what to prioritize. Um, Depending on these companies, uh, on these projects, uh, they are solving uh, different challenges. It's hard to figure out what to do and what tools to use. And of course, uh, I, how I've mentioned shifting left, uh, it means that um, we are now uh, working more closely with uh, DevOps people. It's uh, not like before where uh, security was often a silo. Uh, no one knew about the security guys. They were there somewhere in the building. They were taking care of, uh, of application security. Now it's becoming different. Uh, now DevOps people will need to talk to developers. We need to talk to security people. Uh, we need to talk to SecOps people. Um, so this is also a cultural change, not only a technological change. But how is it? How does it relate to uh, to open source? Because of course we have lots and lots of proprietary tools, but how does it look like from from an open source open source standpoint? Well, of course, uh, just like with everything else, we have a lot of good things and a few bad things uh, in terms of uh, open source security. The good is, uh, of course, that we have a lot of tools to choose from. If you, again, look at the CNCF landscape, you will find a lot of uh, tools that are open source out there and uh, a lot of tools that are uh, mature enough uh, to, to be able, for you to be able to use uh, in, even in a production setup. Like these tools that, I've, uh, that we've highlighted here, uh, Sift and Gripe, uh, they are developed mainly by Encore. And uh, 
they are tools for generating uh, S bombs and uh, to generate the the list of known vulnerabilities uh, from this S bomb or from a container image. Uh, they can work hand in hand. Uh, Trivi is uh, somewhat similar. It uh, is uh, solving similar problems about uh, S bombs and uh, and known vulnerabilities. These projects have thousands of stars on GitHub. They have a vibrant, active community. Uh, people are contributing, people are using it uh, day to day. Um, so this is good. Um, and of course, I've just highlighted uh, three of these projects and these are like closely related and are solving uh, kind of the same problems. But um, there are other tools in the open source space like to name for example, Falco, uh, that uh, is quite popular nowadays, and that is a runtime security tool for for Linux, uh, for real time threat detection, or uh, maybe even the Open Policy Agent. It can be considered uh, a security tool as well, or Cubescape, uh, just to name a few. So we have a broad set of these uh, tools, and uh, these tools are getting more and more mature. Uh, they are, uh, there is a good community uh, around these tools. Um, and in general, the space is, uh, is improving. So if you have all these tools uh, that you can use, um, what, is, what is it that is missing uh, from this landscape? Let me talk a bit about that as well. Uh, and to talk about that, let me uh, start with a simple question or a simple example. Uh, let's say that I want to uh, like um, cut the scope a bit, so not talk about uh, cloud security posture and stuff like that. I'm talking about running a virtual machine in the cloud. How do I know that uh, this virtual machine is secure or not? Um, here comes the question. Uh, what does it mean that it is secure? What does it mean that I'm I'm running a VM uh, in the cloud? It can be an AWS, for example. What does it mean that it is secure? Well, it can mean a lot of different things. Um, it can mean that I'm running images, container images on this system. Um, are these, are these uh, images free of s bomb vulnerabilities uh, or not? Uh, do I have any exposed secrets on my VM? Is there any malware installed on the system? Um, can I conduct a security audit? How can I ensure compliance? What about rootkits? Um, so to define that a VM is secure or not, it involves uh, answering a lot of different questions. I can use open source tools uh, to figure out the answers for these questions, but uh, how would it look like? Um, I can run all these tools. Uh, just give me a give me a terminal. I can type in the commands. Uh, I can use gripe. I can use trivi. I can use git leaks. Uh, check root git. What I will get uh, is a lot of different outputs uh, from a lot of different tools. But how can I be sure that uh, what I'm seeing is uh, getting me a comprehensive picture? of my VM security. Uh, how can I be sure that um, these um, outputs are uh, giving me a complete answer? Well, it's, uh, it's a hard question, especially because um, I can have different tools for very similar tasks, uh, just like I mentioned with Trivia and Drive. So those uh, tools basically answer the same question. Do I have any vulnerabilities in my S1? I can run both, or maybe is it enough to just run one of them? Uh, will I get all the answers? Maybe I will need to run both to uh, get a good picture. But if I run both, then how should I compare the results? Maybe those are uh, reporting completely different uh, outputs. Um, also, I have different tools for different uh, tasks, like. Uh, not only as bomb vulnerabilities, but how I've mentioned, uh, like detecting malware or exposed secrets. 
I can run those other tools as well, but they will generate a different output. What I'm looking uh, at, or what I'm, what I would want to achieve is to uh, get one page of all the vulnerabilities or all the risks on my VM uh, that someone can find. Um, it's not impossible to do uh, with all these open source tools, but it's not easy. Um, but another question is, okay, I just ran all these commands uh, from a terminal, but should I run this periodically? Uh, should I just run it once? Uh, should I run it once a week, once a day, uh, even more frequently? Um, where should I um, integrate these tools? Should I integrate it in my CI CD? Should I just uh, create uh, my own dashboard? Uh, and uh, what we figured out is that it is a hard task. Integrating all these tools and uh, correlating the results and uh, getting to uh, one uh, complete report is, is hard. It probably requires a dedicated team uh, that someone will set up in a company. Uh, they will start working on these things. They will start integrating all these tools uh, into their tool chain. They will probably start building a platform uh, on their own that will generate reports and answer all these questions, but it is a significant effort. And uh, basically that's how we arrived uh, to our question, but what we are trying to solve here, and uh, I will let Tim talk about uh, the next part. All right, thanks Martin. Um, looks like uh, if we wanna switch the share, you have to give up the share. It's not the you take it. Okay. We thought that might be the case. So, all right, with that, Yes. Yeah, so, so what are we trying to solve? So to, to codify or to, to sum up the challenges we just uh, heard from Martin, you know, it really comes down to kind of four uh, guiding themes, right? And we'll call it that, right? So we, we need to build a common platform uh, that takes all of those different outputs, normalizes them, stores them, and more importantly, correlates them uh, to give us for a given particular asset as we as we use the term. And so we can just call that a container. We can call that a VM. We can call that whatever artifact that we're looking for from, an, from the application perspective, right? But we need to correlate all of that information that's been normalized from the outputs to, so that we can, at, for a, that specific asset, really understand what's going on with it, what risks are associated with it. Um, and ideally, uh, you know, we find that, you know, as I mentioned in my background, I'm a big champion of open source. It, it's clear that the open source community is the right place to, to build and develop this platform. And so we, we want to establish uh, this project at, to provide a foundational level of security, bringing together all those risks, providing that visibility, you know, and, and use it as a starting point uh, for uh, just completely, you know, not, uh, just use it as a starting point for understanding the risks in your environment. Right? Now, we didn't get to this point without having already begun the journey and, and, and learned some lessons uh, from the, the bumps, the successes along the way, right? So we started this journey with uh, uh, you know, looking at Kubernetes and, and the workload security around it, right? So this this culminated, you know, our first effort into this was uh, about three years ago, I believe. If you followed out Shift by Cisco and, you know, all the names we've had before that, um, you know, there, it's essentially culminates in the Cube Clarity Project. So where we looked at supply chain related risks, container SBOM and CV analysis, bringing together the, the SIFT and the gripe uh, Martin mentioned uh, and those results and Trivi, it, it, it supports all three of those tools. Doing that in a modular way, and that's the, that's the important part. We, we don't wanna say this project, you know, when we, when we spun up Cube Clarity and what we're looking forward to going forward, 
you know, we don't want to prescribe a specific set of tools. The landscape is huge. Everybody has their favorites. And as the space evolves, new favorites will come up and old ones will fade away. So we want to make sure that this is the modular approach. And so that's what we started with Cube Clarity with uh, being able to support SIFT, Gripe, and Trivi at the same time. And so, we, you know, the project brought it together. It, it's one of the problems with all of this, this space is visibility, right? So we tend to know most of what's going on, but there can be things that happen, things that get deployed and then get forgotten. So being able to have that comprehensive discovery of all the resources in the Kubernetes environment and then calculate those vulnerabilities. And most importantly, the last bullet point is provide a stable um, contact point, right? I'm talking a an API, right? So Cube Clarity, one of the, the nice things about it is that we provided a published API to the, the platform that for the, Kuber uh, the Kubernetes security that you can consistently query against. So no matter which modular scanner you put into place, the results and the findings you were gathered in a consistent way. So that allowed you the stability um, to, to leverage that information and yet move with the times or the changing needs of your project, your application and so forth, right? And so what it looks like here, you know, if we've got time, we'll see that in the demo here at the end, but this, you know, this is the Cube Clarity project and at a glance, you know, we provide the top risks you know, the a summary dashboard of, of all the things that we have found. And of course you can drill down into those particular findings. The next evolution in that, in the, in our journey in the clarity suite was looking at APIs. It, you know, became very clear over the past couple of years that API security is the top vector for many attacks now. Um, and so it has similar challenges that, you know, Kubernetes security has. There's, APIs that get deployed all the time because developers are rapidly innovating. The, you know, the term is feature velocity. We're driving a lot of feature velocity and, and just putting out a lot of capabilities uh, to, to help, you know, our business grow, right? And so we need to find them all, identify what traffic is going between them, east and west, as well as what external APIs we're consuming. Because at the end of the day, we're moving so fast. You know, a lot a lot of the challenges in this space are I'm using third party sources, right? I'm a Python person, so I'm not going to require uh, write the uh, the module to do REST API calls, right? I'm not going to. I'm just going to use the request module, right? And I'm not going to use or build my own API framework. I'm going to use something like Fast API or Flask, right? So I'm going to use all these third-party capabilities. And then similarly in the API space, there are capabilities out there that I'm just going to leverage. Um, I, my favorite example is if I want to have a little weather, you know, dashlet in my, my, uh, my, my, my web interface, I'm not going to write that myself. I'm just going to query data and query information from weather.com. But I have to know about that. What are my developers using? You know, is it, you know, you know, that's the first and most important part. And then if there's any information that we can do to help secure it, which is the next part, right? Those third-party APIs have a published open API specification. If our developers have the time and the discipline, right? They're writing those with their own APIs. And so we can do a specification analysis and look for best practices. Um, but the nice thing about the project is if we're brownfielding into this, you know, we, we rushed out and deployed our APIs and now we're, we have to come back and try and do some security around it. We can actually reconstruct it with API clarity from the live traffic. So this was a very cool benefit of the project. Um, and then once you know the spec, then you can do these ongoing evolution things. Um, as Martin mentioned, you know, the, Things are, you know, today I scan it, it's fine, but what about tomorrow, right? The developer pushed something tomorrow or three months from now that API is still published, but nobody's using it, which probably means nobody's actively maintaining it. And so that zombie API could come back to bite me with a security vulnerability. 
And at the end of the day, we're really driving towards what the industry is looking for, OWASP API security top 10. And with the API Clarity project, you know, we focus on broken authentication, broken authorization, and even BFLA, broken function level authorization. So we do some modeling of the traffic and then look for broken uh, function level authorization in the traffic. So that's a great capability with the trace analysis that comes with it. Yeah, very quickly, here's the dashboard, you know, so we can see, right, the, you know, the inventory of the APIs, how they've been discovered, you know, the, uh, you know, some status information, and then the findings, you know, we could, uh, I, I, we, we're not going to cover API clarity today, because we're going to focus on some of the other things. But uh, the project is out there. At the end, you'll see some links about how you can engage in it. Um, and there's a couple other projects, but for the sake of time, we're not, we're not going to go into them uh, too deeply. But to sum it all up, you know, to get back to the journey and what we learned, right? We we had some very solid successes with these projects, right? The, we we got some traction with, you know, an interest uh, uh, with a with some uh, colleagues in the in the industry around API security, around Cube Clarity. Um, and we did a good job of solving those domain specific issues with the main specific, you know, back ends. Um, and it proved to be quite successful um, to, in being a foundation for something broader. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I work on a product that Cisco, you know, um, develops and, and that is, uh, you know, these tools were the back end assessment engines of, of that broader product that we're, we're developing as, as part of the Cisco organization. So, uh, so they very good foundations, but the problem is, is that we, when we started this journey, we, you know, we were focusing on those domains. So we weren't thinking at that point, what was going on and the industry, uh, both with, you know, the commercial products we're driving in outshift as well as the open source ones, the industry is driving towards more and more consolidation and correlation. As Martin pointed out, it's it's at the end of the day, a security engineer or SecOps person has to have all of this related. And if they and their the teams are just too small and, and getting too constrained to be able to build those platforms that Martin was talking about. Um, and unfortunately for the different projects we built, you know, we, they weren't, they, they were, you know, they were designed very fast and very specific to that, those domains. We couldn't really extend the existing projects that were there, which leads us to the new effort that we're launching, right? Uh, Open Clarity is going to be the new uh, platform uh, approach for bringing all these tools together across the different domains. All right. So with that, you know, the, you know, the four, um, those four driving principles we had before about building a platform, you know, those come down to the three, you know, we, we uh, boil these down to the three particular things that we're going to focus on at the beginning, right? which is providing that platform with a comprehensive view, right? Bringing together, you know, when we think cloud native security, we're frequently thinking about containers and Kubernetes, but the reality is, is that, you know, virtual machines are part of these environments um, because, you know, lift and shift does happen, right? Um, but, you know, there's a lot of consolidation that that is still going on that to, to get to a cloud platform. So virtual machines play a component. There's also serverless functions out there as well, right? So they, you know, developers have shed virtual machines and containers and Kubernetes and just gone straight to serverless. Um, but at the end of the day, so we have to provide that visibility across them all. Um, and, but the key thing here with any successful platform is this has to be easy to consume. Uh, we use the term all the time frictionless here, um, but we have to be able to onboard this quickly, get results quickly, and then 
and then use that that information to help build the skill sets and understand what are, what's going on in your environment, um, how to start getting awareness of the things you need to learn and things you need to remediate. And so we, you know, with all those lessons learned, with all those guiding principles, you know, where we're going with this, right? So we're, um, we're building a new project, or, or I should say we built a new project uh, to, to start that foundation as well as in, in investigate a new space, right? So that is the VM Clarity project that you see on the screen, what we're talking, what we're gonna demo here. Um, and that has all the bits and pieces for the foundation for open clarity. And so we've we've built this out, we've proven to ourselves that we can build a scalable back end. We've we've started with new capabilities because as Martin indicated earlier, you know, that looking at VMs, what does secure mean with a VM? You saw all the categories, right? And um, from vulnerabilities to malware to misconfigurations, right? So that was the perfect um, problem set to really prove to us that we can bring in multiple different tools into a common platform. So that's, that is why you see a VM clarity um, as the starting point, All right? And with that, I'm actually going to jump into a demo and show it to you. So with that, we will go to VM clarity, All right? So this is what that looks like. Move the video out of the way so I can see, there we go. All right. So, with the other clear, like with the other clarity projects, you know, we're going to give you the summary of the information up front, right? Top risky assets, top impact findings, impacts, and so. But again, we're bringing together multiple tools and multiple information together for from those different tools. So these are broken down by the categories. You know, the first one is vulnerabilities, exploits, misconfigurations, right? secrets, malware, and rootkits, right? So those are the, and then, um, so that's, you know, the, the types of risk findings that we present when we talk about impact. We also have, you know, packaging information, um, and primarily from a, the, the point of the packaging information is that SBOM-like information for a VM, right? So what are all the different uh, packages software libraries and the independencies that go into those particular VMs. We pull that out and then, you know, summarize those findings here. So these are the findings, the finding information that, is, you know, was discovered by it, right? And if we want to drill down into that, we go straight to the findings page. Hopefully my port forwarding is working. Maybe it's not. So if you'll give me, let me pause the share and go to my port forwarding here. Okay, resume sharing. There we go. Yes, my my port forward timed out. Apologies for that. All right. Um. So yeah, so we we went from the dashboard directly to the detailed finding list. You can see that we found you know in the vulnerabilities, which is the default view, fifty eight hundred vulnerabilities in this cloud account that has just you know a few VMs and of course some some unhealthy VMs just to show some results, right? So we've got uh, in, in multiple pages of uh, vulnerabilities we can look for. You know by default it sorts by the most recent. We can certainly do that by severity. Right, so now we have the most critical ones. The searching or, or the filtering capabilities is, is very powerful. So I can do things like found on, um, you know, so basically limiting my results to the most recent scan, right? So now here are the most critical things from the most recent scan of the, the, the machines. We do maintain a history. You'll notice that the number of vulnerabilities dropped. So the previous sets of scans are there um, with the timeout, I believe, of 30 days, right? So the, the, the findings can age out. But we do maintain that history. And then, you know, that's CVE vulnerabilities, right? Um, exploit, you know, the ability to exploit uh, the VMs that are in my environment. 
the misconfigurations that are available and just to drive down into that super quick, right? I'm not checking for password strength. So I'll flag that as a misconfiguration because that's not a best practice, right? Secret malwares, rootkits, and then and package, right? And, you know, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll just show the kind of packaging information that we show. Again, that's that kind of SBOM-like material of what package was found, what licenses it has, and what asset it was attached to, in this case, a VM that had that very cryptic AWS name. Right. And if we really care about the scan details, you know, this is basically when did I see this last? So which particular on-demand scan or scheduled scan did I use in order to find this particular package? Right. All right. So that's kind of a, a detailed view of all the findings, um, what we've discovered. And the way that we drive that is with scans, right? So we can do on-demand scans here uh, and we can configure them in a couple of different ways, right? So these are the ones that were one-time scans as you can see here. I can do filtering in the, in fact, why don't I just uh, uh, edit the existing scan here. So this is the scan definition. I can do everything. I can define a, a particular scope, which uh, in the context of clouds are regions, specific VPC. So I can really target these scans for particular times for particular destinations. Um, I can scan everything, whether it's running or not. I can do filters, as you can see here, where I filter based on a name or based on a label um, and, and so forth. And so when I go to the scan type, this is where I can start bringing in all the different scanning technologies based on the back ends. And then when do I want to do this? Do I want it to be a scheduled time? Do I, do I want it to set it up one time at midnight later tonight when I know there's a low period? Or do I just want to do it now one time? Right, so all these capabilities exist from an orchestration perspective, as well as if I've got a very large environment, right? I want the scan to complete in a reasonable time. Uh, I can kick up the number of scanners that are operated in parallel. And since these run in the cloud environment, that would of course induce a cloud cost. So you wanna balance this number with your budget, and then to help with that, you could also use spot instances to help reduce that cost of the scanning. Um, it's an, it, you know, and there's two benefits to doing this in your cloud environment. One is you don't have to worry about provisioning anything yourself. The, the orchestration of VM Clarity does that for you, but also all of your data stays in your cloud environment, right? So we're not bringing this down somewhere. We're not, um, you know, putting any demands on where that information, where that VM lies. Okay, so that's how you would set up a scan job. Um, you can see the, you know, from reviewing this, if I wanted to kick this off again, I hit the play button. So even if I do a one time, I can repeat it, you know, push the button again, start another scan and it will go off and running uh, and generate more things. And then from an asset perspective, you know, again, the point of the platform is to bring all these findings together and, and relate it to a given asset. And this is that view, right? So this is where I'll have um, all the, the asset findings, or, you know, all the assets that I've scanned here for my environment and their related findings. And then I can drive down into this and see them in a summary view. All right. Um, with that, I'm going to quickly show you the additional information that we're looking to bring in from Q Clarity. So, you know, just a quick recap before I do that, you know, this is the launching of the backend and the, the vision for open clarity. So we're, we've, we've proven out the backend is modular, is scalable, and now we're looking to bring in Q, uh, the Kubernetes related information, which, you know, there's a great deal of overlap, right? We, when it comes to CVE vulnerabilities, secret detection, right? So there's a lot of overlap. And so it's a natural sense to bring in Cube Clarity, right? So here is that dashboard. And so some of the things that would come back, uh, come in to the open clarity, you know, some of those types of information would be you know, the Docker CIS benchmark for that those containers, right? If I go down into that, right? Was this Docker container built 
in a healthy way? Is it matching best practices? Right. Um, if I look at there's the application side of this, right? So the application side looks at it as from a, a a lens of how it was deployed in the Kubernetes cluster. So from a Kubernetes perspective, you know, we start with a deployment, a daemon set, a stateful set, right? Some sort of generic thing that we call workload. And from that gets a replica set and a container. So how was that deployment defined? What container did it use? What settings did it use? All of that information can get rolled back up into, um, into uh, uh, open clarity to en enhance that asset information. Um, and then from the runtime scan, uh, you know, th this project, you know, similarly, you, you could do one time or recurring scans. So the runtime scan is just that, that project's way of doing it. But this is the way that we get to look at uh, vulnerabilities. Um, what also Cube Clarity brought, one last thing, it's no time to demo it, but um, the ability to run those vulnerability assessments against containers, against software, against serverless functions um, in the pipeline. So there is a, a CLI tool in the Cube Clarity project that will get ported that will then allow you to do pipeline capabilities and feed that information into the back end to then correlate with the assets that we've seen thus far. And with that, I believe I hand it back to Mark. Uh, stop share. There we go. Okay. Let me reshare. Um, okay. Um, thank you, team, for the demo. Uh, before we finish, uh, let me say a few words about how you can get started with this project. Because, uh, well, it's one thing that uh, we develop uh, these open source tools uh, inside out shift, but uh, it would be even better to have a vibrant community around these projects. And uh, we encourage everyone to uh, get participated and uh, just get started with these projects try these out <clears throat> if you find any issues uh, feel free to report it um, maybe feel free to fix some small things and uh, submit a PR on, on GitHub uh, but really how you would get started um, of course we have installation instructions uh, available on GitHub you can follow this link um, but we wanted to um, have a really uh, easy way of starting things uh, if you get started with VM Clarity. So let me uh, share it with you how it looks like on AWS. For AWS, uh, we've created a cloud formation template that uh, is able to set up the whole environment uh, on AWS. So you just download the cloud formation template from GitHub, uh, deploy it through the CLI, or you can use the wizard and uh, it will uh, get the whole VM Clarity environment up and running in a few minutes. If that's running, you can open SSH tunnel to the server um, by copying the command from the readme. And uh, if that SSH tunnel is live, then you can just access the VM Clarity UI from your browser. That's good. But um, here I have a small diagram uh, that makes it a bit easier to understand what's happening behind the scenes. Because, you know, uh, you can create a cloud formation template, but um, what does that cloud formation template really do or what kind of resources does it contain? Well, um, VM Clarity has its uh, own isolated environment. So it will create uh, a separate private network within your selected AWS region. That will, of course, have an internet gateway. Um, and that's how it will be able to access the internet. Um, it will have a public subnet inside that contains the VM Clarity server that is actually running the backend that is able to uh, schedule the scans. And uh, that's how you can uh, interact with VM Clarity. That's how you uh, reach the UI. But it also have uh, has a private subnet uh, 
uh, inside that same uh, VPC. And that private subnet is actually used uh, to uh, scan the snapshots of uh, the different AWS VMs that uh, that VM Clarity would scan. So as Tim uh, showed you in the demo, you can configure uh, VM Clarity to, for example, uh, scan a specific uh, security group. If that security group contains eight VMs, 10 VMs, those VMs won't be affected uh, by the scan. Uh, yeah, we really like the word frictionless, but it really is frictionless and also agentless. So it doesn't mean that we have an agent that VM Clarity deploys on your VM that will run the scans and so on and so on. But it means that uh, we will uh, create a snapshot of your existing VM. We will put it uh, in this isolated environment. Your production environment will continue running uh, without uh, being affected. Uh, we will scan the snapshotted VM. We will report any vulnerabilities. We will connect it back to uh, the original VM. And uh, that's how uh, things are happening. It's really important to understand because this is actually one of the main benefits uh, of VM Clarity because you won't be at risk uh, of, um, I don't know, uh, doing something with your production VMs while uh, the scans are running. Uh, those can fail, those can uh, produce errors and uh, you probably don't want that. Um, agentless is something that is uh, more and more uh, um, popular uh, nowadays. Uh, no one really wants agents on their VMs, and uh, that's how VM Clarity works. Of course, if um, you have your VM Clarity environment up and running, you can get started with your first scan config. I won't go into details here, as uh, Tim uh, Bob gives you uh, in the demo. That's how you define uh, the scan config scope how you select scanners and uh, how you configure the scan schedule. Um, if you're not on VM Clarity, but you're interested in Cube Clarity, uh, the installation process is of course a bit different there. Um, it is just like uh, how you would usually do it on Kubernetes. Uh, you add the Helm repository, uh, you install the Helm chart that contains Cube Clarity and uh, you will port forward uh, the Cube Clarity UI to, to your local host. So that's how you get started. And um, again, uh, feel free to join us on GitHub or any other of our social channels. Uh, we have a Slack channel uh, where you can join the conversation. Uh, feel free to do that. If uh, you happen to try out VM Clarity, Cube Clarity, API Clarity, and uh, have some issues, uh, you're free to uh, to submit an issue on GitHub, but you can also join Slack and uh, ask us directly. And uh, someone will always be there and uh, try to answer the questions uh, that come up. And of course, uh, KubeCon North America is coming. We will be there. Uh, we will have a nice booth. Uh, we, will have a, we will have a lot of interesting things, even a coding challenge. Uh, powered by Cisco DevNet. Uh, so come visit us, uh, try yourself out and uh, learn more about our open source projects. We have other things uh, outside of security as well, uh, as mentioned with the logging operator and bank walls that are just um, going through the CNCF sandbox project. So come visit us and join the community. Uh, we are always happy to uh, to have more people on board uh, with this open source project. Um, and thank you. Uh, we are at time and uh, we have finished. If uh, you have any questions, uh, then feel free to type it in Q&A. Uh, we will do our best to, to answer them. If there are no questions, then uh, thank you for attending. Yep, Q 
Q&A panel is clear. So yes, thank you very much for attending. Thank you so much, Tim and Martin, for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. Oh, it looks like maybe we got a question. Oh, just someone saying thank you. Um, as a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars and have a wonderful day.